What separates a great investor from an average investor? Is it an early affinity for markets? I put a satellite dish on top of the dorm room so I would have access to real-time stock quotes. An unconventional path? What I really wanted to do was ski. So I left Wharton and I went up to Maine and became a ski bum. A never-ending thirst for knowledge? It is a constant education each and every day. An acute attention to detail? I was down there for three weeks. I met every tenant. I was counting the car traffic. I was learning the business. A willingness to take a risk? If you want to produce return, you have to be willing to take risk. Or the ability to recognize a mistake and move on. I don't mind a 90% chance probability of failure if there's a 10% chance of changing the world. In How to Invest, I hope to provide a glimpse into the thoughts and practices of the world's great investors and hopefully inspire a new generation of professional investors. In my pursuit of identifying the traits and skills of a great investor, I first looked into their backgrounds. I found many were raised in blue collar or middle class families. Rarely were they from fabulously wealthy families or families where there was a history of investing professionally. But their path to a career in investing varied. Some, like Ron Barron, the mutual fund manager and investor with more than $50 billion under management, started investing as a teenager. Yeah, for my bar mitzvah, I was interested in the stock market because I had friends of mine who had been given stock from their grandparents who were prosperous uh, in Eastman Kodak and Polaroid. And I said, I want to do that. And so my father said, we can't invest in stocks. You know, we've never done that, you know, family. And in fact, one of the ideas behind my business is the idea was I wanted to be able to have my, people like my parents be able to invest in the stock market. So uh, uh, I saw that. And then he said, well, I, I had $1,000 at the time. And he said, well, if you show me uh, why you want to invest in a company uh, and you put all your money into one company uh, then, and, and show me why, uh, then I'll let you do that and I'll open an account for you. And so I did research, I would go to this brokerage firm and I would, it was called uh, McDonald and Company, they were from Cleveland and they were right by Asbury Park High School. So I would go there after school, uh, sports and girls and stocks, and I would go there after school and all these guys, old guys, 40, 50 years old, <laughs> they're sitting there on these green chairs and looking at a tape that hardly moved. I think the New York Stock Exchange was 25 million shares a day and maybe American was a million or two million shares a day. So I look at it and I got a report on this Monmouth County National Bank and I start reading it and it was around the corner in where I lived in Allenhurst outside of uh, Asbury Park. And I told my father why I wanted to invest in it and he let me invest. And the stock was $10 a share, 100 shares. And then the stock, Every day for the next six months, seven months, every day it either stayed the same or went up an eighth. And it was printed the 15 stocks in the Asbury Park Press. And every day stayed the same. And then, uh, and then it got acquired at $17 a share. So my $1,000 became $1,700. I said, man, there's nothing to this. I want to do that. So I was interested. Hedge fund billionaire Ken Griffin also turned an early affinity for math and computers into an early career in stock trading. Let's talk about your background before you started Citadel. You were born in Florida? I was born in Daytona Beach. My father worked on the space program back in the 1960s. But I spent my formative years in middle school and high school in Boca Raton, Florida. And you were a pretty good math student and I'm told a computer nerd as well. Is that fair or unfair? Well, I appreciate the compliment because to be a computer nerd has obviously turned out to be a pretty good place to be in life. And yes, I was very interested in both mathematics and programming in high school. And it, it's defined my career and has had a very important role in my life. So you went to Harvard College. Uh, most students there are taking courses or their athletics, but you were maybe doing that, but you were also trading securities. Is that true? That is true. I, I started a, a small partnership my second year at Harvard to engage in convertible bond arbitrage, which was a bit of a off the beaten path occupation for a, a kid in college. But I had a, a great fascination with markets and I had an opportunity to invest capital markets in my, in my college days. And it was an incredible opportunity. It was a really great learning experience. But in those days, it wasn't common to be able to get stock uh, prices instantly. You had to get a special terminal or special uh, antenna to let you get the stock quotes. Is that right? So it's, what's amazing is, is, you know, I love the line people go, well, that's how we've always done it. And I, I get to think back to the early days of Citadel where always did it meant we used a fax machine which you and I, of course, have memories of. And the fax machine was revolutionary. 
in the 1980s, real-time stock prices were actually difficult to receive. And I put a satellite dish on top of the dorm room so I would have access to real-time stock quotes in managing the portfolio that I managed. And what did the Harvard people say? Interestingly enough, back in the 80s, Harvard had a general prohibition on commercial activity in your dorm rooms. So I had to go to the building superintendent to get an exception to put the satellite dish on the, on the roof of the building. And fortunately, he was willing to grant me that exception. But not every investor saw their future in finance early. Real estate titan Sam Zell and myself studied the law, became lawyers, and hated it. I was always a good enough academic to get from here to there. Uh, so when I wanted to go to law school, I got seven A's. Uh, but I didn't get very many A's before that. And, uh, and I basically used the four years of, of being an undergraduate to build a real estate business and build other businesses. And I just had a great time. So you were doing some real estate on the side while you were in college. And then you went to University of Michigan Law School. And you, to please your mother or father, you said, I'm going to go to law school. But you weren't that interested in being a lawyer? No. Never. As a matter of fact, I ended up, you know, graduating and becoming a lawyer, and I practiced for four days. Four days. That's, uh, I didn't realize you practiced that long. Four days. Four days. And so in the did... morning of the fifth day, I went to see the senior partner, and as only a 24-year-old could do, I looked at him, I said, I just don't think this is a good use of my time. <laughs> he said, okay, there's the door. Uh, I mean, no, actually, what he, what he said is, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm just going to go back to doing deals like I did when I was in law school and in the real estate business in Ann Arbor. And so he said, well, why don't you stay here and we'll do the legal work and we'll invest in your deals. And so that's what we did for a year. And then there's activist investor Nelson Peltz, who didn't see the point in studying at all. What I really wanted to do was ski. So I left Wharton and I went up to Maine and became a ski bum. What did your family say, uh, Nelson, we really wanted you to go to Wharton and be a good student. You want to ski. I mean, that's not what you're supposed to do. That's correct. They did say that. <laughs> what did you do? You said I'm I going went, to ski? I, I, my father was an amazing guy. He wasn't happy that I left Wharton. He wasn't happy that I was a ski bum. And he wasn't happy that I grew a beard. But I did all of those things. and. Uh, the snow melted in late spring and came back and I had a, a summer job offered to me in Mount Hood, Oregon to help them in, teach racing to young kids in Mount Hood, Oregon. And I needed some money to get out there. I asked him if he'd give me a job on a truck, a hundred bucks a week, two weeks. That was all I needed. He said, fine, shave your beard off. and." Do it. I said I, I would. It was only temporary at the time. So I shaved my beard off, and after about a week on the job, I started telling him things that I thought that were missed opportunities. And he set me up beautifully. He said, why don't you stay here and do what you want to do instead of going out to Mount Hood, Oregon? Well, I did. And that's, that's what happened. There are also great investors like Paula Volent, one of the country's most successful endowment heads, who came to investing after a completely different career. I studied paper conservation, restoring prints and drawings. I worked at the New York Historical Society for a while there. I then went to work at the Palace of Fine Arts in their conservation lab, and then I went to Los Angeles where I worked at the LA County Museum. I did um, study, I did uh, scientific work at the Getty. And then I set up my own conservation studio where I worked with contemporary artists like Sam, uh, Ed Ruscha, Sam Francis. And I was running my own business and I realized I needed to know a little bit about finance because I was working with very expensive works of art. I was running a studio. And so I started taking a couple business classes at UCLA, and through that, I got introduced to Yale School of Management. And, and, and I, but I got into Yale School of Management at the same time I got offered a fellowship at the National Gallery of Art, where you and I both serve, um, the Leischer Fellow, um, and I worked in the paper conservation lab there, combining paper and paintings techniques for conservation on contemporary works of art. 
So you did that for a while, then you went to Yale School of Management? My husband and I had been trying to have a child and it wasn't gonna work, so, you know, it wasn't happening, so we said, okay, we, you can, well, let's go, let's move to New Haven. And of course, that was instant, and my daughter was born after my first semester. So I took a break, and while, when my daughter was probably two months old, I went to David Swenson and knocked on the door and said, hi, I wanna learn about endowment because I'm gonna work in a museum. And this is about David. David looked at my resume. There was no finance at all. And he took me in and I started filing and helping organize things. And little by little, I got projects to do. I, I remember he had me do a big research on uh, soft dollars. That was one project I worked on. And little by little, I became incorporated into the investment office. Coming up, we hear about the extreme intelligence and attention to detail that it takes for success on Wall Street. One of Sam's favorite Samisms is we suffer from knowing the numbers. Another trait of great investors that shouldn't surprise you is they all tend to have a high degree of intelligence. Many excelled academically, but true success, as Mary Erdos, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Asset and Wealth Management, points out, comes from training and continuing to educate oneself. So training uh, on Wall Street, but specifically in wealth management, is a, is a very, very long process. We, we have 2,200 analysts starting today and they're going to be working through the summer. We have 3,600 analysts across J.P. Morgan Chase that will that will uh, start at the very end, in the uh, September time period for their full time role, and we work very hard to go through in depth training and then to work through which ones actually are good at stock investing, which ones are good at M&A transactions, which ones are good at helping people understand things in a more simplistic manner. That's a two to three year training program. But that's pretty fast. If you think 10,000 hours is about what you need to master any subject, if someone comes in and has a regular you know, eight hour a day job five days a week, it's gonna take you about five years to have a base level mastery. On Wall Street, it's more like 12 hours a day, six days a week, that cuts you down to about two and a half years before you become mastered in something. Once they've got that under their belt, they can then join a team. And if they've been successful going through the analyst program, joining a team, then the team will work through how that works. But it is a constant education each and every day. Every morning we start uh, with an eight o'clock meeting, and I call it like a mini university. And it's not just about what you've read in the newspapers as to what happened overnight. It's about understanding how all of those components fit together in a client's portfolio and then what might be right for you would be different than somebody else and you're synthesizing all that information every morning and then you're going out and you're figuring out how to apply it to each situation. Dawn Fitzpatrick, the investment chief for George Soros, is of a similar mindset to Erdos. For her, the constant pursuit of new ideas and new voices keep her ahead of the game. So I read a lot, you know, in the morning I'll skim through two or three different papers um, during my days, I'm meeting with a lot of smart investors and, and smart people running companies. Um, you learn a lot from there. I talk to peers. But I think um, part of the trick of this big business is being able to really aggregate and assimilate information. Um, and one of the other tricks of this industry is, is trying to find sources of information that are different than the other people in the business because you don't want to get crowd think. And I think that happens a lot in this business. Everyone's talking to the same people and a view becomes consensus that might not be really grounded as well as it should be in facts. Attention to detail also sets great investors apart as described by two real estate legends, Sam Zell and John Gray. You know, one of Sam's favorite Samisms is we suffer from knowing the numbers. Um, I think we've managed to uh, tip throw to, through the tulips for the last 50 years by never allowing ourselves to get swept up in the enthusiasm of whatever the current event might be. And I think by maintaining that level of discipline, 
Uh, yeah, we've made mistakes, and that's to be expected, but we've, they've all been, quote, controllable. Uh, no one mistake uh, was ever, you know, catastrophic. The first deal I worked on was a shopping center in Chesapeake, Virginia, the Great Bridge Shopping Center. It was a $6 million transaction. We borrowed four, so it was a $2 million equity check. And you would have thought I was buying the island of Manhattan. I mean, I, I was down there for three weeks. I met every tenant. I was counting the car traffic. I was learning the business. And it was an amazing experience because I was the chief bottle washer. I was the waiter. I was the maitre d' because we were this tiny little business, and I was learning it firsthand. Now, one of the most famous sayings in the real estate world is location, 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 meaning that the location is everything. And also, you might say it's local, 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 because most people make real estate investments kind of in the area they know. You've made investments all over the world. How do you, sitting in New York, know about the value of real estate in Europe or in Asia, and how hard has that been to build a global business? So I think the key to that is to have a global footprint, to have hundreds of people all over the world. And it took us a long time to do it. I mean, we've been at this for 30 years, and you really need talented people on the ground. You need local people who know the markets. The one thing I'd say, though, that is advantageous about real estate is so many of the trends we're seeing, particularly driven by technology, are the same around the world. So when we started buying warehouses back in 2010 and we noticed that there were these e-commerce tenants showing up and we started buying more in the U.S., it wasn't a big leap of faith to say the same thing's going to happen in Canada, it's going to happen in the U.K., in continental Europe, and across Asia. So I, my view is that if you have the skill set, you can evaluate, plus you travel a lot, like you, I'm on planes a lot. I no longer run the real estate business day to day. My colleagues, Ken Kaplan and Kathleen McCarthy, have done an amazing job. But they have teams around the world on the ground. And we're local in those markets. And I think that's really important. You cannot buy real estate in Mumbai the way we have flying in and flying out of New York. Next, we look at how skilled investors evaluate risk. We are 100% confident every time we make the investment that it's going to be a big company. Um, we are wrong a lot of the time. One of the easiest paths in life is to accept and follow conventional wisdom. But what great investors have found is that path doesn't lead to easy returns. Often, the biggest wins come from going against the grain and taking a risk, especially if you're a leading venture capital investor like Mark Andreessen or Vinod Kosla. Each top-end venture firm has its own bar, so it has its own set of criteria for kind of whether it thinks a deal should be done or not. And then the top-tier venture firms as a group have kind of a collective bar, which is kind of, is a top-tier venture firm going to fund this company or not? And it's actually easier to answer that second question than it is the first question. Like, after you've been in the business for a while, you tend to have a sense of like, okay, this is going to get funded by a top-end venture capital firm or it's not. Um, if it is going to get funded by a top-end venture capital firm, and if my firm doesn't think it's a good idea, you do wonder, like, who's right, right? Because the other firms are quite smart. And so this is one of the regular discussions that we have, which is like, okay, if another one of these top-end firms is interested in it, that might be a very, that might be a very positive, substantive signal. If the other top-end firms have looked at it in all past, that might be a substantive, negative signal. That said, some of the best deals in history have been passed on by a very large number of people. Um, it's one of the classic examples, Uber was passed on by a very large number of venture capital firms. It, Uber was actually available to be invested in on this site called AngelList, where literally anybody with a checkbook can invest. And so every once in a while you get these outliers, and, and it's fundamentally a game of outliers. Like the, the, the money is made on the aberrations. And so I would say you want to be generally open-minded and humble about your conclusions about what all these different signals mean. Now, a famous economist, Herb Stein, once said, uh, if something can't keep going on forever, it won't. Right. In other words, at some point things settle down. Do you worry that because the economy might soften at some point if interest rates are raised, or just because of the business cycle, the wonderful world of venture capital will slow down a bit? And is that a worry for you? 
So it's a cyclical business for sure. It has a history of boom-bust cycles, you know, basically just like any other sector of the economy. Um, that said, I guess I would say we, we do not have a great track record in our industry of predicting these cycles. Um, and I think most of what we, I think most of how we either perform or fail to perform is micro, not macro, which, which is to say it's based on the success or failure of individual companies. Um, and, and if you just look at the history of, of, of venture capital and startups, many of the best companies have been formed during the hot periods, but also many of the companies have been formed during the cold periods, right? And there, there are pro, pros and cons to those periods. Um, and so, look, it's, it's possible there's another cyclical boom and bust cycle. Um, you know, our, our, our plan for that cycle would be, basically be to just keep going, uh, keep working with our existing companies, help them through it, keep investing in new companies all the way through, and basically bet on these sort of micro-level fundamental technological and economic changes that continue to happen. Most of what we do is uncharted territory. I would say the one piece that works really well in our business is go for higher risk, higher consequences. So most people in business reduce risk, increase the probability of success, which is reduced risk, but at the expense of making the consequences of success relatively inconsequential, you might make two times your money or something. I, for our business, what works is I don't mind a 90% chance probability of failure if there's a 10% chance of changing the world. And that's very much the philosophy. It also goes with, it's, it's the right way to make huge impact. It's not just venture capitalists taking risks. Columbia's endowment head, Kim Liu, also says gains are not without calculated risks. I think the best investment advice I've, I've ever received is the fact that we are in the business of taking risk. And so, if you want to produce return, you have to be willing to take risk and you have to be willing to analyze and mitigate that risk the best you can. And to make sure that the return potential of an investment is equal to the risk, but you can't avoid risk. Now, what do you think the most common mistake investors make generally? I think the most common mistakes is following the herd and just doing what everybody else is doing and not making sure that an investment is appropriate for your institution and making sure that the analysis that someone else is, has done is not appropriate for you or is not congruent with the way you think about the world. I think there are a million ways to make money. I think there are a million strategies that can work. Not every investment is consistent with your strategy. And so I think there's a lot of herd mentality and that's a huge mistake that happens. Now sometimes risks don't pan out and mistakes are made. Now I might sit and stew over the loss for a decade or two but a truly great investor, like Kleiner Perkins chairman John Doerr, has the ability to admit a mistake, cut his losses, and move on. When I first came to Silicon Valley, I hung out at Stanford on the second floor of Margaret Jack's Hall. And down that hall was Andy Bechtelsheim, who founded Sun Microsystems. John Hennessy, who became president of Stanford, founded MIPS. Jim Clark of Silicon Graphics. What I didn't do is go down into the basement where Len, Len and Sandy were starting Cisco. So that was a, a miss on my part. Uh, more recently, I had the opportunity to invest in an electric vehicle company. And the conventional wisdom was venture capitalists ought not to invest in electric vehicle companies, not new car companies at all. There have been 400 new car companies in the nation's history. Every one of them but one has gone bankrupt. But I was still very attracted to the market and we had the choice of backing a brilliant car designer by the name of Henrik Fisker, or uh, an ambitious, slightly crazy entrepreneur by the name of Elon Musk at Tesla. Well, we made the wrong decision, but Tesla did very, very well, and so did electric vehicles. So um, when I make a mistake, I only think about it for the next 10 or 20 years. Uh, how long does it <laughs> take for you to get over these things? Well. I don't obsess on these, but I won't ever forget.